Okay, welcome back. Shavuot Tov, good vach to the seventh of eight sessions of Asia Taurus Care of Training Destinations program. It's great to see all of you. Hope you guys had a nice two weeks. And we've got two unbelievable classes planned for tonight. Before that, I just want everyone to start thinking about Kirov questions they have. For the second class, the speaker is going to be more of an interactive format and taking questions. Any Kirov questions you have, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Also, keep in mind, next session is very important to be here in order to receive your Kirov training certificate. Whoever did not give me their name, at the end of the second session, we're not going to have a large break today, so at the end of the session tonight, I'll take your name as you want it to appear on your Kirov training certificate. This past week's parsha, we read about the big day, Kohen Gadol, and the Torah tells us that Kohen Gadol's clothing is the covet of Tiferes, to bring honor and splendor. And there's an honor and splendor that goes to the Kohen Gadol and goes to the Torah in general. And many Jews are not aware of the beauty and the sweetness of Torah that we experience on a day-to-day basis, whether it's through learning Torah, whether it's through performance of mitzvot. And our goal here is to take the beauty of Torah, take the sweetness of Torah, take the depth of Torah, and to feel responsibility to realize that just like any other mitzvah, the mitzvah of spreading Torah to others. And it's a big schuss tonight to have a class on the Jewish concept of love, dating, and marriage. Like most classes here, it won't only be helpful in being a car of others, but it'll also be very helpful for our own personal avodas Hashem. Leo Ellis is an unbelievable Makarev, Rebbe at Asia Torah, who's involved in many different facets of Asia Torah with the Beginners Program. He's the head of student affairs, dealing with the day-to-day life of the Talmudim. Tremendous Mesiris Nefesh, tremendous insight and ex- experience in Kirov. And it's a big honor to call upon Rebbe Ellis to speak about the Jewish concept of love, dating, and marriage. What are you talking about? This is yours? Oh, it's recording. Okay. Okay, guys, so I understand the purpose is not just to give a class, but you guys can get the class. So I think what we'll do is I'll probably just give the class straight through, stop me with any questions, and then afterwards we'll break it up and we'll try to clarify if there's any shilas. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah? yeah? Okay, fine. So, okay. So it goes like this. The way I usually start is I go like this. Um, is anyone here someday planning on getting married? Please raise your hand. Someday. Majority? Majority? Cool. Okay, hands down, hands down. Okay, question number two. Is anyone here someday planning on staying married? Raise your hand. Uh, hands down, hands up. Does anyone know what the divorce rate in America is today? Oh, it's, it's, look, you, you get various things. It's something like 50 to 60 percent. Yeah, something like 56 percent. If you want to make yourself a champion, you know, with the best chances of getting divorced, I hear you have to move out to L.A. It's like 75 percent out there. <laughs> it's like it's wild. Look, the institution of marriage is breaking down. There's two things we want to get into tonight. Number one, what is causing all the problems? And number two, not to, how not to get into it. Now, the way I started is the following. I get a love story. It's my favorite love story. I'm telling them I'm romantic. And it's very possible, you know, you've heard this story before, but bear with me because I've always had a couple st- questions in this story. And it goes like this. <laughs> Roughly around, let's say, 1,800 years ago, there's a fellow by the name of Akiva. And again, I go through the story very quickly. You guys stay with me. You've probably heard it before. Uh, this guy is brought down. He was a shepherd. He was 40 years old. He was dirt poor. The guy was an ignoramus. He couldn't read or write. It's brought down in its early days when every saw a rabbi, he wanted to bite their bones like a donkey. Now, why a donkey? A dog bites, it hurts. A donkey bites, it breaks bones. But somewhere along the line, this guy flips over and he says, you know what? I really want to study Torah. But there's a problem. Four years old, ignoramus, couldn't read. Like, forget it. What happens is he was working for the richest guy in Jerusalem, a fellow by the name of Kol Savua. Now, Kol Savua tremendously revered Torah scholars. He was whining and dying in them. He had this beautiful daughter, Rachel, and of course he hoped one day Rachel would meet one of these guys who was happily ever after, etc. Anyways, Rachel meets Akiva, and she realizes, wow, this guy has more common sense, good manners, etc., 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 than anyone she knew. She thought if this guy would go off and learn, he'd be the greatest. So secretly, she goes up to Akiva, says, Akiva, if I agree to marry you, we go off and learn. What does the guy say? Sure. Yeah, I'm your man. <laughs> they get engaged. Father hears about it. He hits the roof. He goes up to Rachel and says, you marry this, again, ignoramus, out of the house, cutting you off, not even a penny. 
And Russell says, okay. They get married, and Father, true to his word, cuts him off. And whereas before, I suppose she was waking up in the morning putting pearls in her hair. Now she was waking up in the morning pulling straw out of her hair. They're <coughs> desperately desperate for her. Finally, Ruckel says to Kiva, time to go off and learn. He goes off for 12 years straight. He's learning with the greats of the generation. He does relatively well. 12 years later, he becomes Rebbe Kiva with about 12,000 students. At this point, he says, oh, maybe it's time to go home and see my wife. Reasonable? Reasonable. He goes home. Nobody knows he's coming. He's about to knock on the door and see his wife for the first time in 12 years. And there was a neighbor there, and he was like, you know, he's dropping through the window. The neighbor's going, Rachel, how long can you go on 12 years? What kind of a marriage is Rachel says, if I had my way, he'd go off for 12 more years. And Akiva, who's like this, about to knock on the door, see his wife for the first time in 12 years, says, oh, I have permission. Drops his hand, turns around, goes off for 12 more years. At the end of 24 years, again, he does relatively well. Rabbi Akiva, at this point, 24,000 students, he decides, oh, it's time to go home and see my wife. Now, this time, everyone knows he's coming. Big parade, procession coming into town. The neighbors go off to Rachel and say, Rachel, you might want to borrow a dress. You know, Rabbi. She says, leave me alone. Leave me alone. She's still dressed. Around. I, I know, just leave me alone. The parade gets in town. She bursts through the crowd. She sees her keeper for the first time in 24 years. She falls at her feet. It said she was laughing, crying, all these mixed emotions. The student had no idea who this woman was trying to get her out of there. This woman arrives, and the says, stop what belongs to me, and you belong to her. Now, to make a happy ending, what happens is uh, Father nullifies his vow when he realizes his son-in-law only became the greatest, one of the greatest rebbies we've ever had to live a very happy life. Rachel passes away. Akiva certainly remarries one time, possibly twice, and at the end of his life, he dies a martyr's death at the hands of the Romans during the Bar Kokhba revolt. End of story. Okay, I've always had two questions on this story. Number one, now, and it granted that all our traditions are there to keep us a uh, lesson, teach us a lesson. If you're a Hollywood script writer, you're about to write the perfect love story. Would you write a story like this, boy meets girl, they get married, and then he splits for 24 years? You know, it's like a little radical, yeah? And even if they fell in love, and let's say they really did, I have no reason not to think so, if anyone here has ever been through a relationship and it goes really great until you find out what the other person's really like and then it falls apart, and you limp around for a week, a day, a month, whatever. But after a while, you start forgetting the other person. Like time gets and things. What was keeping them together for 24 years? Now, I switched. That was the introduction. To get in this class, what I want to do is the following. I want to talk about a body of information that I don't really want to talk about, but we have to push through it to make sure we're on the same page, okay? So we start like this. I want you guys to define love for me. The rules of the game are you can't get holy, theoretical, philosophical, mystical, cosmic. I want something nuts and bolts on the ground. Love is, and don't say, not having to say you're sorry, yeah? And then I open it up. You guys, what's love? Give me a definition. Deep Give me a definition of love. Anybody? Deep connection. Okay, deep connection. I hear it, but let's try to get as fine-tuned as we can. Anybody else? Yeah. When the top priority in your relationship with that person is bettering that person. Is bettering that person. I hear deep relation, top priority, bettering the other person. Keep going, guys. Let's make yeah, it chill in here. It's I after Shabbos. Everything that affects that person affects you in the same emotional situation. Everything that affects the other person affects you back like a mirror. 100% I hear. Anyone else? Yeah. Giving to one another. Giving to one another. How do you say love in Hebrew? Ahava. 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 Built-in definition. Ahava. I give. 100%. Anyone else? Yeah. Looking at the good of the other person. Okay, you guys, yeah. Unconditional relationship. Unconditional, okay. So first of all, I agree with everything that was said in this room. For lack of time, we've got to push a little bit here, and especially this first part to push through. But I say at this point, let me give you guys, after letting everyone fight it out, let me give you a traditional Jewish definition, and then I'll try to defend it. It goes like this. We say love is the emotional pleasure a person gets from seeing nice stuff, virtue, in another person. Again, the emotional pleasure a person gets from seeing nice stuff, virtue in another person. Who am I going to pick on? Can I pick on you? Sure. Great. Okay. Who do you think knows your faults more than anyone else in the world? Forget yourself. Um, one of my friends. One of your friends? Yeah. Okay. You sure about that? Yeah. Okay. And who do you think knows your strengths more than anyone else in the world? Probably my parents. Probably which one? My mom. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> it goes like this. Um, in the Western world, they say love is blind. In Judaism, we say love is a magnifying glass. 
When you're in love with a person, you have a fix on who the person is. That's an initial hook to get you interested. Remember Rachel, she saw more common sense, good manners, et cetera, et cetera, and it keeps something else nobody else could see. Anyone here from New York? Who's our New York guys? Okay, New York. You guys know Green Haven State Penitentiary? You guys know the place? Great, because if you did, I'd run out of the room. Okay, it's like this. It's maximum security. In order to get there, you have to be top rate, murderer, kidnapper, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many years ago, Isha Torah was asked to give the discovery program. Everyone know the discovery program? You guys know it? Does anyone not? If not, you've got to find out about it. It's a great program. Anyways, we're asked to give this seminar in Green Haven State Penitentiary. At the time, I think there were like 34 Jewish guys. You know, percentage wise, was very small, but, you know, chabal. Anyways, the guys went in. They gave the seminar, and Baruch Hashem, everyone made it out alive. But the point is the following. One of the presenters, they found out the day before they came, it's fascinating, it was family day at Green Haven State Penitentiary, meaning they got, you know, they had this big, what do you call courtyard, and they got a barbecues, invited, invited mom, dad, wife, kids, whatever to come. He said he found out almost all of the prisoners' families came. Now, this is the point. You're there at Green Haven State Penitentiary Family Day. You go up to Mrs. Jones, and you say, Mrs. Jones, do you, do you like your son? Do you love your son, the guy here in stripes, Bobby? What would she say? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you say, you know, the guy's a murderer. He's a kidnapper. How would she defend the guy? Once you push her, plastic the cliches, oh, he's my son. Or, how would you defend the guy? What would she do? What's that? It's not his fault. Yeah, but he's a murderer. You know, how would she defend the guy? He's my son. Yeah, great. He's a murderer. How would you no, defend the guy? She'd focus on his positive Yeah, she started rattling off all the nice things about, of course, you know, he murdered. The baby. She asked him to take out the garbage, whatever. All right, anyways, the point being the following. When you're in love with a person, you have a fix on who the person is, and that's when she'll hook to get you interested. Let's stop here just for a minute. Is that okay with everyone? Questions? Yeah, please. When a person, when a person is so fixed on a person, um, like when a person has one view of yeah. someone in particular, uh-huh. It's not that they're, like in this example, it's not that they're denying it, you know, they're just more pinpointing that one thing. Right. That's helping them cope with the fact that, yeah, my son, is, you know, he's not a terrible person because he did this thing. It's not necessarily that they really love the person. I hear it. So, like, again, it's, it's, a, it's an analogy I give. I've never had arguments on it. And by the way, later on I say, if you ever see Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, you've got a big hand problem on your hand because no one's perfect. The point is, you're really attracted to the positives. You can deal with the negatives. You know, you want a balanced, a balanced uh, view. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay, let's move. Okay. Go again. Rachel, she saw more common sense, good manners, et cetera, in the Kiva nobody else could see. Again, that was the initial hook that got her interested. Now, moving on. 24 years they were apart. 24 years. What was keeping them together for 24 years? And again, if anyone here has ever been in a relationship, it's really great until it falls apart, and then you go on crazy for a day, week, month, whatever, but after a while, you start forgetting the other person. What was keeping them together for 24 years? Anybody? Throw it open. What was keeping them together for 24 years? What's that? Love. Uh, well, that's too big. I have to get really, really fond of it. Yeah. Magnification of the good. Magnification of good. Okay, over magnification, I hear. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. She knew what he was doing. She knew that he was studying and coming already. She knew what was, and so she, she knew what was. Okay, what you're saying is great, but I'm going to push you off for a little bit later. What you're saying is good. There. Keep going. Anybody? Yeah. He's living the life that she married him for. Okay, 100%, but I'm going to push you off too. There's something more basic. What you're saying is great, though. Keep going. Trust in each other. What's that? Trust in each other. I hear that. Keep going. Belief in greatness. Belief in great. Okay, wait, wait. Let's start like this. I'm not going to ask you a trick question. It goes like this. In the early stages of a child's life, let's say you have a three-year-old boy. He's more close to mommy or to daddy? Mom. Mom. Okay. So it goes like this. True story. In World War II, there was a young Jewish family, mom, dad, three-year-old son. What happened was, you know about World War II, Russia came into Poland like 40%, Germany came in 60%, Poland just disappeared. Anyways, dad was out with three-year-old son, mom was somewhere else, war hits the town. They got separated from the entire war in 1939 to 1945, six years. Six years later, in this case, miracle story, everyone survived. Six years later, dad shows up with nine-year-old boy, Happy reunion with mommy. At this point, the son was more closely related to dad or to mom? To dad. Now, granted, negative side, mom wasn't around. But on the positive side, what created the bonding that normally would have gone to mom? Mom wasn't around. And the negative, well, what caused the bonding between the dad and the kid? 
What about being together? So they both, they What's both that? Shared um, the, the loss of the mom. Well, right? Shared the loss of the mom, but that's more the negative sense, the kolbasa. Yeah. What about giving? I'm not arguing. What about giving? He gave everything to the kid. So what? But why did that cause the bonding? Giving is love. Giving is love. Yeah. Giving is love. Let's try to find him a little bit more. What you're saying is good. Yeah. But what about that? I agree, though. What about that? Why does that create the bonding? Why? What about the appreciation? It's kind of like a gratitude debt combination. Right, let's go a little bit further. You're saying good. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah, please. The child needed him to survive. Uh, okay, all right, wait, 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 wait. So let's let's go like this. Um, many many years ago, I was in the living room in a certain city here in Israel with some very distant cousins of mine. These are five old men. True story. It's a wild story. These guys actually came over from Europe with their mommy. Five boys when they were little kids. They grew up to build the largest private corporation here in Israel. Quarries, road building, wild stuff. Now, sitting there in this living room, these five old men were laughing their heads off. What was the joke? True story as well. They just found out their girl cousin in New York just won the New York State Lottery. She just won a million bucks. They were laughing. At One guy said, I can't believe it. I worked my whole life, my knuckles, to my bones, for my millions. She goes and buys a ticket, and she's a millionaire overnight. They thought it was hilarious. But then one guy said something I thought was so sharp. He said, okay, but I bet you I love my million more than she loves hers. True or false? Why? Hard to work for it. What happens when you work for it? You appreciate it. Why do you appreciate it? Because you earned it. What happens? What? Why? I'm not arguing. Because you earned it. Why? It's all right. But what about why? Yeah. Because we have limited amounts of effort. So when you put your limited amount of something into something else, you lose sight of it. Okay. Let's go one more step. One more step. Uh, in New York, I hear they still have newspaper stands on the corners, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so the story is, you are 91 years old, you've thrown your entire life into cornering the market, like every corner has your name in it. You're 90 some odd years old, you're losing your strength, you have this empire out there, when you look at your empire, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Your life. Thank you. Drool, when you throw your sweat and blood and tears into something, what happens is you start seeing a piece of yourself in the other thing. So step number one in love is, A, seeing who the other person is. And by the way, if you have to meet Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, you have a big problem in your hand because nobody's perfect. The point is you really like the positives, you deal with the negatives, got it made. And then if you want to make a grill of it'll grow and grow and grow and grow, what happens is you throw yourself into the other person, ahava, I give. What happens is you start seeing a piece of yourself in the other person where you stop and the other person begins, starts to become a little bit blurry. Everyone follow what I'm saying? Okay, now this is not what I want to talk about. We're almost there. One more thing I don't want to talk about, and it goes like this. Um, I'm going to ask a highly unfair question because almost anything you guys say will be correct, but let's try. I'm going to fish for a point. 60% divorce rate in America. You want to be a champ, go out to L.A., 75%. What's the single biggest factor that's messing things up in the world of marriage today? Premarital sex. Premarital sex is a big one. Anyone else? Cheating is a big one. Porn. Porn is a big one. Selfishness is a big one. Boredom. Boredom. Okay, wait. wait. Uh, everyone knows Woody Allen. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone not know Woody Allen? Okay. Yeah, he's like a, he used to be. I don't know. I suppose he's a hilarious comedian. Movies, stuff like that. Unbelievable. Anyone ever see Play It Again, Sam? Anyone ever see that movie? Okay. There's this scene in this movie where Allen is in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, and there's this huge, like, Jackson Pollock painting on the wall, and there's this really nice girl there, and he's trying to get to know her. So he goes up there, and he says, what do you see in this painting? Nice line, yeah? And she says, I see the negativeness of the universe, the hitty, lonely emptiness of existence, nothingness, the predicative man forced to live in a barest, barren, godless eternity like a tiny flickering flame, an immense void with nothing but waste, horror, and degradation forming a useless, bleak, straight jacket and a bleak, absurd cosmos. And Alan goes, oh, nice. <laughs> and he says, well, tell me, what are you doing Thursday night? And she says, I'm committing suicide. And he says, oh, what about Wednesday night? Right, anyway. <laughs> when boy meets girl, you have an option. Either you look at the inside or you look at the outside. Yeah, if I could get this thing called human touch and I could decant it and put it in a little bottle to sell it, yeah, i put this huge label on it, just like in a package of cigarettes, use this thing, human touch, with extreme caution. Why? Because it's guaranteed, I will repeat, 
guaranteed to produce feelings of bonding and closeness. Great, what's the problem? False. Irrespective of whether two people have any business being together at all. Point. When you start to get into physical relationships really quick, you start feeling close to the other person. Why? Kaha. That's the way it is. It's mechanical. And then the romance goes on for a day or a week or a month, whatever, but all of a sudden you start seeing aspects of the person you can't deal with. And so it's going like this. Oh, I feel so close to this person. Why? Because maybe you do. But I can't stand this person. Why? Because you can't. And you go back and forth and back and forth, start ripping yourself in two. And the more bad relationships you drag yourself to, it makes it very hard to be open in a relationship. And if you're not open, it will not work. Everyone with me on this? Arguments? Okay, now I flip around to what I really want to talk about. And it goes like this. This is the junction point in the class. I'm going to make a highly theoretical statement, which I hold by. See if you guys agree with me. If it's true that love is the emotional pleasure you get from seeing virtue, nice stuff in another person, I want to say theoretically, now again, maybe hyper-theoretically, it's possible to love anybody. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah. It might take a lot of work, but theoretically, why not? Okay. My question is the following. If theoretically it's possible to love anyone, does that mean theoretically it's possible to marry anyone? What do you guys say? No. Yeah? No? Okay, we got a split decision here. All right. So I let people argue here, but then we get into it. The answer is no way. <laughs> um, guys, give me a... Working definition of marriage. Again, you cannot get theoretical, cosmic, mystical, religious. Because give me something nuts and bolts working on the ground. Love is or marriage is. Yeah. Having common goals. Okay, having common goals. Good. Anyone else? Let's make a show. Anybody else? Deep connection. Deep connection. Common goals. Keep going. Two people that complement each other. They're like complement each other. Okay. Sharing life. Sharing life. Hundred percent. Dedicated relationship that is forever. Dedicated relationship that's forever. I like it. Oh, say that again? You go by. You go by. I'll have to think about that one. I like it. Anyone else? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, all right. Guys, so let me, at this point, again, we're, we're time, time short here. I'll give you a working definition of love, and this is the part of the class I really want to get into, I tell them. Uh, and then we'll fight it out. It goes like this. Short definition of marriage, Jewish definition is two people making the commitment to achieve life goals together. Finish. Two people making the commitment to achieve life goals together. Point. In Judaism, realize marriage is not a goal, it's a means to a goal. Meaning, real people in life are moving to a place. They're going a certain direction. One of the most important things in life is A, figure out what is your major goal in life, and then B, go shopping around for someone in the same direction. Now let's say you don't do that. Let's say you don't do it, right? Has anyone noticed that if you don't make decisions, life has a very funny way of starting jamming you in corners and forcing decisions out of you whether you like it or not? Anyone ever notice that? Yeah? So you meet a person, and you're having a great time, and you get married, and you lock yourself into position, but all of a sudden, you have to start making real decisions. And who says two people are going to think the same? She wants that, and you want that, and she wants that, and you're kicking a time bomb, literally a time bomb. Um... I was giving this class some years ago, <laughs> this is wild, to a, uh, a, it a class. And this guy came up to me afterwards and said he's uh, from Holland, Dutch guy. And he said in Holland, they have what's called common law marriages. I mean, they have it all over the place where the people, they live together, they have kids, house, business, dog, everything, kids, everything, but they're not married. And he told me, it's wild, if for some reason after 25 or 30 years, they decide to get married, and get this, within six months, they're divorced. Now, how did he know he was a lawyer that was a specialty, separating couples like this? And I thought to myself, what is this? You know, 25, 30 years. And then, all of a sudden, it dawned on me, you know, a romance can go on for a heck of a long time. But all of a sudden, for some reason, things shifted, and they really had to start making very, very, very serious decisions. Boom. Again, main point is you have to figure out what is your major life goal and then go shopping around for someone in the same direction. If you don't do that, good luck. Which brings me to the next point, goals. It goes like this. Right now, guys, we are looking for 
major goal that can keep people together for the next 120 years. And again, we're only talking about a man and a woman. So what are two goals, are goals people can work on to make it through the course? Yeah. Okay, number one is kids. Now at this point, I say to the, you know, let's brainstorm everything, anything we can think of. What else? Yeah. What's that? We have to get more, what does that mean? Meaning spirituality? Okay, so I'm going to put spirituality. Keep going. Yeah, what else? Anything we could think of. Living in that sort of community. Okay, okay. Can, you, can I put socioeconomic position? Is that okay? So I'm going to go like this. You know, keeping up a socioeconomic position. Anyone else? Yeah. Career. Okay, career. I'm going to put job. All right, we'll put job. Okay, what else? Whoops, another B there. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Service. Service. I'm going to, can I put cause? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, cause. What else? This is a great list. Anyone else? What's that? Values. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna jam that into spirituality. Is that okay? These are big, you know, big things. Anyone else? Anything well, else? Wanting to like, invest in their relationships. Say that again. Like them wanting to have relationships. That, that's a given. They want to do it. Uh, but what, what are the points they can work with together to make it work? Anyone else? Yeah. Legacy, Legacy like leaving something on afterwards. Yeah. Okay, legacy. That's, uh, I'll have to think about that. Anyone else? Yeah. What's that? Looking for out of it. We're figuring out what's going to happen. What's going to keep it together? So they're going to do that. We're at the major, major points. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. This is a cool list. So we'll go through the list. It goes like this. Now, at this point, I tell the people right out, guys. I'm going to go black and white, so we can see the differences here. Now, it goes like this. Again, I tell them we're looking for the single biggest safety cable that's going to hold things together when things start falling apart. And again, you're talking about two people living together. That's not bad enough. One is a man, one is a woman. By the way, there's over 40 differences minimally between men and women. There will be problems. What's the safety cable? So it goes like this. I start like this. Kids. Now, I say, look, don't get me wrong, but certainly one of the goals of every marriage should be family kids. But... It's not going to be the safety cable when things start falling apart. In America, we have a term for it. Anyone in here of empty nest syndrome? Yeah? Okay, what's empty nest syndrome? Where you get together to raise a family, and then the little kid grows up, and the chick splits the nest for college, and all of a sudden, he's looking at her, and she's looking at him. If never got higher than that, divorce is so common. There's a term for it. It's called empty nest syndrome. So again, don't get me wrong. I have to keep repeating this all the time. You know, I'm not saying you know kids should be family. One of the goals of a marriage, but it's not going to be the safety cable when things start falling apart. Everyone with me? Okay, moving on. Next, now I jump over this one, <laughs> and I go like this: social economic position. You got together to maintain a certain sort of lifestyle. Okay, the scenario is like this: you're 55 years old, your debts are up to here. And you just fired from your job. How's your marriage doing? Yeah. Okay, again, it's not necessarily going to be the safety table when things start falling apart. Job? That's a great one. So the scenario is you are the president of Chrysler Motor Corporation. You work 32 hours a day. <laughs> How's your marriage doing? <laughs> not so good? Okay, cause? So cause. <laughs> I usually give this example. You know, you meet your spouse on a Greenpeace boat in Alaska, you know, you're out to save the whales. It's a match made into heaven. You're both totally into it. So what happens when either A, you save the whales, or B, the last <coughs> whale dies? Now, don't get me wrong. I used to live in Alaska. I love whales, all right? But anyways, the point is following. It says in the Talmud, a love based on a cause is a weak love because when the cause is gone, the love is gone. Okay, maybe you can flip to another cause flipping around your whole life. I hope it works. Again, we're looking for the biggest safety cable uh, in possible. Look, I put a lot of thought into this, and a lot of other people too, and I want to say, now, by the way, I always tell them, we're looking at this one way in a minute, I'm going to flip it over and look in a much deeper way. It goes like this. You know, we're not here for a heck of a long time. 90, 100 years, 120 years, whatever. If there's a reason we're living life, it might be easy, it might be really interesting to try to figure out what it is and maybe do something about it. Meaning spiritual goals, what it means to get from one side of life to the other with a smile at your face at the end of the day might give you a half a chance of making it work. Now, having that, I have an old Brandeis University study that I read very quickly, and I tell them it's very highly outdated. But many, many years ago, Brandeis University did a study. At that time, there was like a 50% divorce rate. 
And they found out that the couple belonged to a show. It cut the divorce rate to half the norm. Now you get 25 on how many divorced. Next, the couple moved to a Jewish neighborhood, cut to a third of the norm, 17 out of 100 getting divorced. Next, the couple went to show once a week, four to the norm, 12.5 on 100 getting divorced. Last but not least, if a couple was quote unquote religious, whatever that means, they didn't define it, eighth of the norm, six out of 100 getting divorced. It seems to indicate there's something there, but now I flip it around and I try to explain it in a different way. You guys realize, kids, social ethnic position, job, cause, to a great extent, these things are out side of a person. If what you're leaning on for your support in marriage is outside of you, good luck. Because how do you, you can't control things outside of you. If that is your major support, you're on very shaky ground. <coughs> Spiritual goals are totally, totally, totally internal. If you're strong about your spiritual goals, you know which way you're going, that's the main pillar you live your life on and you lean on, you can literally be living in a world that is falling to pieces, exploding all around you, you'll be okay. Everyone hear the shift? Okay. So I've done the first part now. This is talking about goals. And now I shift over to the second part. So does anyone have any questions in this part? Yeah, please. If, if the marriage can if the marriage can survive all of the um, the the from kind of spirituality, why is it that even in the from community um, divorce rates are, are rising? So I want to say two things. Number one, first of all, it's in the air today. We're living in a crazy world that you just breathe it in. But that's, that's a different story. I mean, this was predicted thousands of years ago. But number two is, I want to say one of the biggest problems today is, even in our from world, it's to a great extent, it's millimade. It's we just, you know, you grow up in the system and you, you haven't really, really banged out your goals. And because of that, you can get ambushed. You know, if you really haven't thought it out and some smart guys comes along with some great ideas that seem really, really, you can get taken off on left field easily. It's one of the biggest problems we have today. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, when it comes to the goals such as like kids or yeah. you have a common cause you want to work right. with, um, what are they? Wouldn't there also be signs say that like two the kids rather growing together also as parents, they have better connection even as the kid leaves like, okay, it could happen, it'll not be empty messing you know, but it, it depends on the couple. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there are cases where the kids are unfortunately, because of that, the parents have to stay together for whatever reasons in their head, and the kids become <coughs> the problem. Because of you, I have to stay together with this other person. You follow what I'm saying? It can get a little nasty that way. Again, I'm, I'm repeating, I'm saying the worst case scenario. I'm talking black and white. Right, so, okay, yeah. when it comes to spirituality, for example, you have a young couple, you know, and you know, they're going to have kids and everything. Uh-huh. They grow up, the kids don't want to go that way, and that could end up tearing the entire family apart. And then now, if, if, let's put it this way, if they really understand how things work, they also understand where the you know, end of day is today, there's, there's lots of things going on. I, I don't want to so much get into that right now, because I, I want to make sure we get to a certain body of information first. It's we're living in very difficult times that have never been possibly faced before in history. And again, that was prophesied from before. Any other questions? Yeah. If the, the most like, important thing is something internal for the person, is yeah. it possible that even not necessarily in like, a spiritual way, but even like if they make this sort of level, if you have the same same goals internally, uh-huh. it can work. Like, yeah, yeah, again, I'm not saying, right now I'm, I'm saying first I say morose, I say I'm going black and white. It's not that none of these can't work, but again, the point I'm missing, we're looking for the biggest safety cable that will hold us together. Because again, we're living in a world with a 60 to 75% divorce rate. What's the big safety cable that's going to help us give us the biggest odds of making it work? I always go over that point. You know, again, you know, uh, or cause, it could keep it together. But again, the point I always emphasize is these things are outside of yourself. You know, once my kid grows up and starts choosing his own whatever, or he splits a nest, or once house for something, the guy gets fired, and if you're in a socioeconomic position, good luck. You know, what's the biggest safety cable? I always go back to that point. And what if you have a secular goal that are internal to you? That also be hey, look, you have to be careful because some secular people are tremendously, tremendous believers. You know, unbelievable. You know, because they had great mommies, <laughs> amongst other things. So you know, you have to be a little careful when you say secular people because some of them are unbelievable. And sure, goals are goals. You get distracted spectacularly in all sorts of ways in life, and you know, you might not wake up till you're over the cliff. Anyone? Yeah. 
So Rivi's so mentioning that spiritual goals are like kind of an internal thing. Yeah. Can someone can someone posit that it's external also? It's like believing in God. Like I, I view it as internal, but some some might say that it's external. Again, if you don't have it thought out, if you have it internally, you know, there's there's what we call the of the Moach and also the later. If you don't jam it down into yourself, it that also shake your ground. Sure. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by spirituality? Spirituality. Why? What it means if trying to figure out what's the meaning of life, why you're living life, that's that's the main drive of your life. And again, you have kids, you have jobs, you have cars, you have everything else, but the main motor, you guys know, like we have in life, this is not part of the class, but let's say we have different roots or not. We have different roots or not with different desires. So let's say this one is, you know, I'm, I'm totally, totally empty eating popcorn. I don't know. You know, different desires. The question, the point is that everything leans on one main pillar, one main rut zone. You can knock these off, the personal self provides, but if the main pillar of your life is knocked off, the personal will fall apart. This is what you want to be your main pillar. So that's Spiritual goals. You have that realization. What you're looking for that? Yeah, yeah, that's, you have to figure out, is that my, you know, it can't be, a, a, what do you call it, a intellectual, it has to be something you really worked out. <coughs> Otherwise, you know, if that's got to be the main pillar that everything else leans on. Otherwise, you just get knocked off. You could. Okay, yeah. Let's say one of those changes that you <laughs> okay, I hear it. So I want to say it's a very question, the question that's answered all the time. The main thing is if your spiritual goals, your internal deep ones are really worked out and really solid, things like that don't change so fast. I think the biggest problem is when they're not worked out. You just grew up in your condition and this and that. Maybe something can come and knock you off. We were talking about that just before. People can say whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah again, it, that's, that's the whole thing. Like, how do you figure out what the person's about? That's, that's a different problem. But I'm just saying the, the goal itself, if that's the main pillar, you're living your life and you're clear, and she's clear, you'll be okay. Again, you can live in a world that's falling apart, you'll be all right. Okay? Uh, what time is it? Hold on. Oh, okay, let's keep moving, guys. And then afterwards, whether, okay, now, this is where we flip over. So again, marriage is two people making the commitments to achieve life goals together. We talked about our goals, now we have to talk about something as more important or more, and it goes like this. If you go up to a happily married couple, and let's say they really were, and they weren't faking you. And you would ask them. They would tell you at some point in their marriage, she looked at him and he looked at her and they both mutually thought this person was absolutely... What's that? No, crazy. Okay. You sort of set the air off. You set everyone up for that. But the point's the following. Um, again, it's not a problem if there are problems in marriage. Again, there will be problems. You're talking about two people trying to live together for 120 years and that's not bad enough. One is a man, one is a woman. There will be problems in marriage. What's the problem in marriage? The problem in marriage is if you're not willing to work on the problems. Point. Will someone tell me what's the opposite of pain? No pain. Oh, you've been here too long. What's the opposite of pain? Okay, if you ask this to the audience, you can test it. Go on your devices if you have whatever. Ask all your friends what the opposite of pain is pleasure, and they will say, opposite of, see, the opposite of pain, they will say? Pleasure. Okay. 99.999, maybe I'm exaggerating, 99.5% of anyone in the Western world will say the opposite of pain is pleasure. And then I ask another question. Okay. No pain, no gain. We're living with a contradiction. On one hand, we have this idea in our heads, the opposite of pain is pleasure. So what happens? You get into this relationship, it gets a little difficult, a little crazy, a little bit uncomfortable. So what do you do? You pack your bags and you split. What you've just done is relegating yourself to second-rate relationships for the rest of your life. You'll never have a significant relationship. Why? Because it's precisely by working through the bumps together, working through the pain, that's where you create the relationship. And I bring an example. I usually leave, uh, you know, Army unit, basic training, 30, 40 guys from all over the country. They get thrown together. They go three months. They go through hell together. Three months later, what kind of relationships do these guys have? Yes. They're like this. You know, my father, Oliver Shalom, he passed away at a healthy, healthy 95. He was still in touch with his World War II Army buddies. Still, he was like one of the last ones to go. The point is, by work, has anyone here, and this is an example I always bring up to drive it home, has anyone here ever been, you had a team project, or you had something you're working on, you're working with people you really didn't know that well, and you won the game, or the project came out just beautiful? Anyone happened to anyone, did that ever happen to anyone here? How would you feel to the people afterwards you're working with? Good. Good. That's where you create the bonding. And we, smart people we are, we have this idea, the opposite pain is pleasure, it gets a little bit tough, you pack your bags in a split, you've trashed any ability to have significant relationships. Because working together, working through the bumps, that's where we create the relationship. Everyone with me on this? Okay. Now, at this point, um, 
<coughs> well, how much more time do we have? Ten minutes? So at this point, I do a quick review. Again, we're talking about love <coughs> is the emotional pleasure a person gets from seeing virtue in a nice per- in a other person. You want to make a love that will grow and grow and grow. What happens is you throw yourself in the other person. Or you see a part of yourself in the other person. When you stop and the other person begins, it starts to come like blurry. It's a little bit hard to break a piece of yourself. You can love anyone. Yeah, can you marry anyone? No way. Marriage is two people uh, making the commitment to achieve life goals together, which A, presupposes you have major goals. B, you go shopping around for someone going in the same direction. And C, you know, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and a little bit work. But if you work through it, there's no reason why you can't have an unbelievable relationship out of it. Everyone with me on this? Any questions? All right, so I go very quickly. When I run out of time, I have two more things that I talk about very quickly and that people generally are pretty interested in. So it goes like this. I say, does anyone, uh, two more things, anyone know how to find the other half? And does anyone know how to figure out what you're looking for when you're looking for the other half? People always say yes. So, yeah. You just had to show the thing in Oh, Okay. You had a sh- I couldn't hear it. Say. You had like a sure class in Shraga. Oh, in Shraga, okay. So we're looking for differences that you can get around, but also things that you like, and shared goals in the future. So li- I'm going to approach it from a different way. And again, I do this in about five seconds, all right? So it goes like this. Now here, I don't no argument. So it goes like this. First of all, how do you find the other person? So I say there's two aspects. One is uh, mechanical. And the other one is chemical. Now, mechanical, I say, uh, anyone ever seen a movie, a play, whatever, called Fiddler on the Roof? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you guys say, okay. One of the main, minor characters in that movie is the end of the matchmaker. Yeah, okay, now it goes like this. One of the most important decisions of your life, again, you're about to figure out who do I want to spend the next 120 years with. What happens when she smiles at you? Or Again, I'm talking to secular audiences like she touches her face or touches your hand. What just happens to your mind? Everyone agrees? They, you know, you lose it. Look, the point being the following. In one of the most important decisions of our lives, we've always relied on what I call outside objective third parties. Meaning the following. It doesn't have to enter the matchmaker. Everybody here knows, again, you can say the secular audience is people, they just have a knack of getting to people's kishkis really quick. You just understand people. Their job is granted who this guy is and this girl is, positives and negatives, positive and negative. The job is to make sure the gross errors are off the playing field. It's in the ballpark. This is completely, mecha- this is completely objective. Someone with good eyes can figure it out. Now, again, we're not talking about a person who says, wow, two eyes, a nose, and two ears. Two eyes, a nose, and two ears, it's made in heaven. We're not talking about that. We're talking about someone that knows the people, they get in the kishis, and say, you know what, on paper, it looks really good. Meaning the gross errors are off the playing field. Then the two people, they give an example. The example is, um, many, many, many years ago, my brother, when he got an internship, or when he got a med school, he got a med school, and he became an intern. You guys know interns are like low-paid slaves that work crazy hours, like highly dangerous for these guys. Anyways, he was working for the first six months with an intern one year above him, and they're working these rotations together. And you know what kind of rotation these guys are. It was like crazy. Six months later, Mike looked at my brother Bob and said, Bob, you got to meet my sister. Now, did he know his sister? Grew up with her. Did he get to know my brother? These crazy rotations? You better believe it. Uh, so I, 35 years later, didn't it great? The point is making sure the gross errors are off the playing field. Because as soon as she smiles at you, it touches your hand, it t- you've lost it. And again, you're only trying to decide who do you want to spend the next 120 years with. That's all. Next, chemical. The two people then have to get together, and they have to decide if the attraction, the chemistry is there. You have to find your spouse attractive. That's completely subjective. Only something that two people can figure out. But again, if they have the same goal, they're on the same page, they're committed, they know there's going to be work here, roll up your sleeve, it's in the ballpark, and the attraction is there, there's no reason something wonderful can't come out of it. Everyone with me? Okay, and one more point, because we're running out of time in a big way. Um, I asked them, how do you find the other half? Like, what are you looking for when you're looking for the other half? So I say, does anyone know what is the 
most probably considered the best university in the world today. Aside from Asia Torah, that's a given. What's that? What was that? Why? Yeah. Cambridge is great. Are you from England? Oh, that's your. You have an internal bias. Okay. No, Cambridge is great. No problem. What? MIT is great for technical stuff. Harvard is excellent. Oxford is that another Englishman in the class? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, for lack of time, so I say the best university in the world today is life. Okay. Now it goes like this: all of us are enrolled in a full-time university. We're always getting lessons. We're always learning. The job in this university is to face life. What you want to do when you're looking for your other half is you want to see if you ap- appreciate her approach and she appreciates your approach. Why do you have to do that? Because that's what you're going to be doing together for the next 120 years. <coughs> now, how do you do that? When you're going out, you have to talk about real things. And you have to get a little bit of a feel of how the other person approaches the life. i give you an example, not such a good example, but uh, I have a friend who is a rabbi in L.A. of all places. Almost done. And... Uh, one time, a couple came up to them. They were married, and the, the guy said, Rabbi, we got problems. And my friend said, yeah, what's the problem? And the guy said, well, you see, I want kids, and my wife doesn't. My friend said, wait a minute, wait a minute. They were married, by the way. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. You want kids. Your wife doesn't. Didn't you guys, like, talk, talk about this when you went out? What do you think the guy said? <laughs> <laughs> no, and then my friend said, "Well, what did you talk about? What do you think the guy said?" <laughs> yeah, again, when you you have to talk about real things, you have to try to figure out what is their approach to life, and see if you appreciate the way we're approaching, because that's what you're going to be doing together for the next 120 years. Is this sort of clear, guys? All right, any questions on this at all? So the main point is you have an introduction, and then you split the class into two parts. First is love. And love is definition of love, and then giving and giving and giving. Then you have what's taking us out onto the left field, the idea of uh, getting into the outside instead of the inside. Then you ask the question, uh, theoretically, you can love anyone. Can you marry anyone? Absolutely not. Come up with a definition of marriage. And then you talk about goals. Afterwards, you talk about uh, commitments. And then you can add these last two parts in if you want. Yeah. Can you just run through why physical intimacy kind of breaks the marriage? What are you talking about before? So, all right, so very two, two quick things. Two quick things is, what happens is, when you get, uh, when, as soon as you, again, like I said before, you get into physical relationships really quick, you start feeling close to the other person. You know, that's number one. Uh, and then when it breaks up, you know, you go a little crazy. Anyways, the point being the following. Um, what happens is, you start composing a composite woman that doesn't exist in your mind and what kind of a person is going to live up to that yeah 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 you you start thinking all the nice things about all the girls you ever knew in your life and you come up with this composite superwoman who's going to live up to that and it's disappointment for you it's all imagination but one thing I use when people say that is the following I give people a choice A and B everyone has to make a choice here you meet this girl you get into physical relationships really, really, really quick, and it's like the, you know, the, the fireworks hall of fame. Unbelievable. So you get married. But all of a sudden, once you're married, and you start living with this girl, you start seeing aspects of this person you can't deal with. That's number one. Number two, you meet this girl in a hotel lobby, and you talk and talk and talk for like 20 years, and you, you know, you're just like this on the same page. And then you get married in physical relationships, would you rather be a number one or number two? Everyone has to vote here. Who would like to be a number one? Who would like to be a number two? Okay, the point being the following. No matter how attractive the other girl is, if all of a sudden you can't see, you see aspects of this girl you can't deal with, it's not that you'd want to be in the same room with the girl. You'd want to be on the same planet with a girl. It doesn't matter how pretty is and how nice she is. <coughs> Whereas another person, if you're together, you're on the same page, you're going the same direction, people can work together. They can grow. Okay. Isn't that connection that they've built is kind of built on that shaky ground? Wh- which people? The, oh, with physical well, yeah, first? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's based on no ground. It's based on it's imagination. Based on emotions. on emotions and imagination. Because after a while, all of a sudden, you realize... Anyone ever, does anyone know anyone who's divorced here? Anybody? Okay, has anyone heard the statement... I don't know what happened. They're just not the same person I married. 
Everyone hear that one? I want to say they never knew the person in the first place. Unfortunately, after the fact, they got to know him. I, again, I, I'm very careful when I say that, but this is in a class here, so I'll say it publicly. Yeah. One more question. One more question. Okay. How does your partner help your spiritual goal? What can you do yourself? So that's a, it's a big question, but I'm going to say the following. Anything in life has a nimutza. There's an intermediate in life. When you're going from night into day, you have dawn. When you're going from day into night, you have dusk. Uh, when you're coming into this world, from you know the soul world to the world, you have the nine months. And, you know, it, there's there's an intermediate between everything. An intermediate of man to the spiritual world is his wife. I can't get into it now. Uh, <laughs> any questions, guys? <laughs> it's his wife. Okay. Call to our guests.